A very good day. Welcome, welcome to Weekend Life. My name is Minister Nixon. I am excited for you to be with you today so that we are on this program whereby we discuss some of the very critical issues that drive the narrative and discourse in our daily lives. And uh, I know for some it's been quite a, a while before you got, saw us on our screen, but I think you will be seeing us more often with various cases that are making news in many aspects of the society. And today I um, have with me uh, Pastor Mark uh, Ramsing, the founder of uh, Project Rage. Uh, we're excited, Pastor, to have you on board. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Please share with us a bit what is Project Rage, how did it come about, and what's the story behind the Project Rage? Okay, so Project Rage, actually, if we contextualize it, the root um, beginning of Project Rage was I grew up in a family where there was extreme family violence. My father was into drug addiction, alcohol addiction, and I was raised in my formative years exposed to extreme physical and emotional violence, both against my mom and myself. And um, that led to a number of challenges that I faced in my life. However, recently, with the awareness of uh, the increase in gender-based violence, it was an evening where I watched the crime statistics and I remember it was a Thursday evening and I went to bed and found that I became so restless. You know, I didn't sleep the entire night and I, I thought, but here's a problem, but how, how many people actually are doing something about meeting this, this mammoth challenge that we face in society today? Because it's a, it's a generational or a matter that has gone on for centuries and there hasn't been tangible solutions to the challenge. And it brought to mind the words of Edmund Burke that said, um, evil prevails uh, when good men do nothing. And I'm more or less paraphrasing his, his words. So when I woke up that morning, the word rage popped into my, into my spirit and I wondered, what actually does rage mean? And obviously English is a is, is, is an amazing language. So the first thing I did was go to a, uh, a dictionary. online dictionary. Okay. So I went to this online dictionary and I looked up the word rage and obviously the first thing that I saw as a definition of rage is uncontrollable anger. But it didn't stop there. I found that um, the English dictionary also defined rage as vehement passion and desire. And I thought that was absolutely interesting because the sense is that um, if rage is uncontrollable crawl, trollable anger and rage is also a vehem vehement passion and desire, I thought about the challenges of the awareness created around most commonly the perpetrators of um, gender-based violence are, are males uh, from a statistical perspective. And obviously we understand that testosterone is uh, a hormone that creates um, uh, adrenaline and that adrenaline leads to rage but at the same time the same hormone testosterone drives passion and desire and I wondered are we channeling our energy and our uh, capability in the wrong direction and creating negativity out of this interesting hormone that actually is in the male uh, anatomy so in, in essence we're simply saying that uh the rage is a, an emotion or is a stuff can be channeled. If it's channeled to the proper, uh, correct way, it, it, can, it can be positive, not a negative. In the English sense of the word, if we take the word rage and we understand that it's not just uncontrollable anger, it's also vain <coughs> passion and desire, then we understand that there are two options and there are choices that we have as, as a male species. There's either to take this negative energy that we feel and challenge it positively to create um, uh, desire and passion, or we can actually give vent to our full um, ego and allow this 
uncontrollable anger to become destructive in society. And the common challenges that we face is that men prefer to channel that ne uh, energy negatively rather than positively. So but is it not our socialization? Because sometimes we, we are socialized as men that men don't cry, men do not show emotion, men do not just break down. Uh, how then can we be able to, to manage to take that passion and turn it like, if you, if you will, maybe like look at the example of hydroelectric power, you, <clears throat> you get steam that is compressed, that is violent, but that turns out into energy, into electricity that we can be able to use. How can we fuel or turn our rage into fuel? There is two things that a man has um, when, we, when we look at the choices that we make in life. Uh, when, when we come to the choices that we make as a male species, um, we can make positive choices or negative choices. And if we choose to take the negative route, the consequences of that is devastating. And we've seen the devastating result of the choice to actually channel that energy in a negative kind of way that is destructive to society and not just to society but for generations to come. But there, there is a concept of the Chinese concept of yin yang that in each one of us there is, uh, there is good and evil and there is bad and there is good but if we feed the, the good, then it becomes good. If we feed the bad, it becomes bad. So how much of our choices does, does play out in, in, the, in this rage that we see outside? It's absolutely 100% a choice. How we respond to something is 100% a choice. Remember, your thoughts become your actions, your actions become your behavior, your behavior becomes your character, your character becomes you. If you habitually um, respond in a negative way to circumstances in life, it actually becomes entrenched in the nature and the character of what you do, because habitually, every time you face a challenge, and if your typical response to that challenge is anger and rage, it is likely that you, it becomes entrenched in the character of who you are and then you respond, your natural response is repetitive in a way that gives you the idea that rage solves, uncontrollable anger solves problems. But if we understand the devastating effects of, of uncontrollable anger, we realize that we have to harness the power to restrict ourselves from, from responding to life's challenges in a devastating and destructive way. If we, uh, if we look at the current state of uh, South Africa, uh, that's the context where we are in, and mm. in, in where there's road rage, where there's femicide, where there's GPV, where there's crime, those crime also is violence and, and, and stuff. And, w and when you look at the the nature of crime. Sometimes people get killed and then they get, after people had killed them, then they chop them into pieces and decapitate them. How much of that uh, is a manifestation of rage which we have not been able to deal with? Look, a lot of the challenges that we face is two things. Our character is built on one genetics and the other environmental influence. If we have grown up in an environmental influence that um, accepts rage and anger and violence as a norm, psychologically we respond in the same way because it becomes normal to respond in that way because in your formative years you've watched the rage and believed that in your formative years as you grew up, rage is actually the alternative to actually solve and deal with challenges and problems. So it's not just about someone pops up and become an angry person. It's something that happens from a formative age where there's an exposure to this kind of behavior that makes it almost acceptable that this is a normal kind of behavior. So when we look at, at what happens and we trace the root of most people that are violent, it's not people that are actually uh, suddenly become violent. 
It's people who have slowly become violent through the through the environmental influences and the environment that w which they've grown up in. How, how is it to be able to uh, to turn around, maybe tweak uh, the environment? Because environment normally uh, grooms people to become maybe almost who they are. Uh, and then how do you take out, somebody said it was easier to take the people out of Egypt, but not the Egypt out of them. How do you take the Egypt of violence out of people which they have not been able to deal with before? What's critical, and I believe uh, John C. Maxwell puts it uh, quite eloquently, and he says that everything rises and falls at leadership. If we have positive leadership, and great mentorship who can actually help people understand that there is an alternative to what you've actually uh, grown up with. Then they have choices to make and show them the positivity of actually making those right choices. What happens is the mentors of, in society today have actually become mentors who, who propagate the fact that, listen, if you're an isolated child, you have no uh, parental support, you left out onto the streets. Gangsterism becomes the norm because you become accepted. You become mm. accepted into this culture. This culture creates a sense of brotherhood, and this brotherhood actually creates a sense of if you do what we say, we will have great benefits from it. You will have money, you will have influence, you will have power. And it's the wrong people who are driving society today because they create the wrong perception that um, yeah, this is this is actually the norm and can lead to a better lifestyle. The, then w when you get projects like Project Rage that works as organizations, that works in communities, I think you are part of the many organizations that work nationally and internationally to be able to influence, impact, mentor, and, and, and drive a behavioral change. How critical is it to have more of the support and more of other people that have resources to be able to partner with organizations like yours? I think it's so important for us to understand that um, slowly when you begin to influence positivity and you get a group of people who actually stand for a value system that is strong enough to, to share the benefits and the, the, the beauty of actually um, sharing that love and that value system. I think every single one of us in life is driven by a specific value system. And if that value system is actually strong enough to, to, to encourage um, core values like love, integrity, trust, um, um, you know, um, a spirit of, of, um, of unity, those value systems have to be entrenched from an early age. The question is, is it taught, is it entrenched in our curriculum uh, as we grow up from a preschool age in those formative years? Are we doing enough in society to actually not just work on the academic knowledge, but the social aspect of making people understand that the new social norms is actually to, to build a society that becomes a adulthood, that, that becomes an active citizen of actually being proud of a nation going that, forward that 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 that, that um, has a has a good value system. Uh, the, uh, thank you so much. I think we we excited to have um, Pastor Mark from Project Rage share with us some of very amazing uh, insights into some of the issues that are preserving our society and how we're working and how we all of us can be able to play a part to be able to shift our mindset, our narratives, and our direction to what uh, uh, we can be able to have a great society. Uh, Pastor Mark, I also want to be able to now zero in on, on man, because I think one of my interests is to be able to see how can we be able to deal with man, whether we provide leadership or other aspects of the... But maybe my question um, is really going to be, uh, I think a few weeks back there was a, a Twitter thread of how many men were, were sharing their own stories of how they 
got abused by by women. I'm talking about kids that are talking, I say, from three years up to up to 13, 14, 15. Uh, about how they got introduced either into sexual experience, others say they were raped, others say they, they were violated, and others say they are angry. And how much of these issues are, are, the, are what makes up the current challenge of a man that we're dealing with at the moment? I think entrenched in the, in, in the male environment is always men have a tendency to internalize rather than share their experiences with, the, with others. It's because we grew up with the idea that tigers don't cry. I mean, look, we are not animals. We are human. Mm, yes. And we grew up uh, with this misunderstanding that men are tough, they are resilient, but what happens is they act out in ways that are destructive because we are taught that you're supposed to be tough and you're supposed to re respond with, 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 with um, vehement action uh, to defend yourself. When it comes to the way we respond to those things, I, I do believe like I'm a typical example of being exposed to extreme violence to the point where I was very often beaten almost to death. And only for the grace of God, I actually survived that. I was a little boy that was way under my normal weight and I used to be abused and, 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 and pushed and pulled around like a rag doll, kicked on the floor until I had to curl myself into a ball in a fetal position to protect my vital organs. And when um, I was done, uh, that anger was, was, was shared with my mom. But I realized that the intensity of the pain of what I was going through I had two choices. I could, I could actually go on and replicate the behavior of my father because he had entrenched the fact that whatever you do, you deal with it violently. Or I could become sensitized to the fact that the destruction of what he does causes so much of pain that I would never want to replicate that pain in the lives of others. But in life, there are patterns mm. and, and patterns uh, normally uh, form over time and behaviors, when we look at behavior, behavior is a pattern and, and they are either informative, uh, what we call <clears throat> maybe through the process of accretion, where by bit, by bit, by bit, by bit, but suddenly it, it shifts you in, into a certain direction. How much of what we see in, in men outside maybe might be a manifestation of that anger of people that might not have had an encounter to be able to learn how to channel that pain outside into like you have done? I would encourage <clears throat> any man that has gone through difficulties like that to stop for a little moment and do some introspection, which is very important. I think one of the biggest challenges <clears throat> is that it's absolutely simple to learn. But to unlearn is the most difficult thing. And if we can unlearn that this character and behavior is creating catastrophe in the world today, that the UN has actually um, organized an entire section of UN women in a, to address the issues of, of, of gender-based violence against women. So, so what we have to do as men is make a choice and if that choice is to be able to stop just like any addiction anger can become an addiction violence can become addiction just like a drug addiction or alcoholic addiction or an addiction to sex or an addiction to anything the first thing that you have to do is acknowledge that what is what, what I'm experiencing is actually wrong first of all if we deal with that. I think I'm glad we've gone to what the UN and, and the GPV and, and, the, and we are seeing uh, unacceptable high levels of femicide in South Africa, uh, particularly that it directed at women and children. But also we might, maybe shouldn't we address this and say maybe, maybe we do not have 
a femicide problem. Maybe we do not have a femicide mother problem, but we have a mother problem. Because, because the, the concept, if we, if we uh, for example, statistics which you talked about, say that about 61 people get killed every day, according to last year's, um, get murdered every day in South Africa. And, and eight of them are women every day. And about three of them um, are children, which leaves us with 50 men killed every day. And our society as a whole doesn't treat that as a national crisis. If we tackle that and agree and say that we have a, a murder problem, because if 50 men are killed every single day, doesn't make headlines, doesn't bring a change, uh, are we not maybe scratching away? It's not really because in, in general, we, we, we are not, our, our title must be made as a, as a base. Then we can then go to, to femicide, go to fire murders, go to others. Should, are, we, are we addressing it correctly? Look, violence begets violence. Murder is, is, a, is a crime of extreme violence. And if we look at the root cause of violence and address the root cause of violence, we may be able to not just treat the symptoms of violence and become reactive towards the violent behavior by incarcerating, arresting, um, um, over flooding our prison system. So how do we go back to help reshaping the boy child in a sense where he understands that violent behavior is a negative um, characteristic. It, it, it is something that is unacceptable in society. And the one thing that I, I do believe in is that culture actually drives nations and culture drives organizations, culture drives family units. What is the culture that we have accepted as a norm in our society? And if the culture accepts that violence and murder is acceptable to the point where the, um, the response to, to that type of violence does not meet the, the, the intensity of the atrocity that's being committed. Um, let's, let's say somebody commits a murder. Okay, we charge him, our whole ju uh, justice system, uh, lack of evidence, the file gets lost, all of these endemic problems. Um, violence will continue. We'll continue. So, so how do we respond to, <coughs> to, to violence in a way that teaches people that there are consequences for the action and those consequences are severe? Uh, when we look at, for me, I think part of the critical aspect is looking at the numbers. Mm. When we say we have 21,000 people that got killed mm. and, and, and we have uh, literally well over 18,000 of those are male mm. and maybe over 80 uh, over 80 percent or 85 percent of them are male of color mm. and they might be killing themselves mm. and how are we going to be able to, as a nation to be able to maybe it's projects like people project rage to be able to simply say go back to research and say what do the numbers tell us so that we can be able to assist the people that, but sometimes policymakers are influenced by, by lobby groups, by pressure, by news, by uh, people go outside and start things trending, and then the politicians ought to come and give a statement and they seem to be doing something, but the underlying cause is not really addressed. How do we address so that we, like a country that is not at war, like South Africa, cannot be above what Syria that has been at war uh, has in terms of murder rate. How do we do, particularly, maybe from other people that are working within your space, like pro rates, what is the direction that needs to be taken? Do we have sufficient empirical data? I, I strongly believe that data drives 
statistics. Statistic drives business intelligence. Business intelligence sets the pace for um, strategic intervention. So are we dedicating sufficient resources to gathering proper data that can be analyzed and actually become a business intelligence um, tool for us to reshape the policy and the strategy of the country to be able to address some of these root causes in a way that would bring about solutions to the problem. But uh, maybe on that one, if the statistics is there, mm. and, the, and the, uh, maybe the data is there, but maybe is it that maybe we do not have people that know how to do research, that can interpret the, uh, the data, so that they can be able to formulate decisions that are, uh, that are that, that data driven. Uh, maybe that might be our problem. Some say, yes, we've got the statistics, yes, we've got the numbers, yes, we've got the trends, yes, we know which areas are hot spots, but beyond going in front of a television and announcing those, there is no strategy to be able to use that data to inform the, the preventative measures that go, that go ahead. In our academic system, research is critical and, and the results of that research sometimes becomes a book on a shelf that, that says, great work, you've got your MBA, you have your doctorate. But are we saying to ourselves, what was the real intention of having to go through the entire chain of gathering this information? It should be to be able to solve problems in society, specifically around social issues. So the question is, are the people in power taking the results of this research and shaping the policy and the strategy of the country to meet those needs? Because then they become relevant to actually addressing issues that not just have outputs, but have impact on societal challenges and problems. And, and that's what's critical for us because academia has a direct link to what, what shapes the strategy in a nation. We have to be able to respect the, the, the result of, the, of, of that research that, that occurs. How the, maybe going, I think there will, there will be huge need maybe for people that are within this space, people that want to work. Uh, because I think for the past few months, the number of Zoom meetings on GBV uh, far outweigh uh, the whatever is available before, but we seem not to be making really an impact. And, but also in terms of how do we do a lot of things that are mitigating factors, because part of the challenges is even our society, because part of how do we teach people to be able to, to defend themselves in terms of uh, avoid places or situations that can put them at harm's, uh, harm's way, so that some of those issues that, that relates to, that de-escalates some of the challenges that we do have. Maybe finally, let me ask a question. Uh, what has been your observation? Because part of the big cry has been that uh, anger is so much in our society to such an extent that even uh, which has been the cry of people within the farming community that people get killed but after they've been killed they get mutilated is it something that is driving inside the is a psychological issue uh, on 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 people that can that do the violence is there any data, is there any interviews that goes inside the minds of these people that commit these crimes to say what happens? If you've already killed somebody, why do you cut them into 100 pieces? Look, I, I don't believe that we're spending enough time on studying the field of criminology, um, behavioral analysts, people who actually get in and understand the psyche behind some of the challenges that we face in the country. We throw people into a prison system, but we don't actually analyze 
what actually led to the whole chain of getting to the point where um, this violent behavior has become so extreme. We look at children in society and we see them kill little animals and we think, aha, it's a joke. But those are the early warning signs. If you get children who, who, who naturally seem to want to, to kill bugs and kill animals and kill little things, it should already trigger a concern in a parent's heart to say, this is abnormal behavior, my child is acting out. So, so what I'm saying is that it's commonly um, understood that what a child learns in their formative years, they seem to continue in, in, for the rest of their lives. So those formative years are so critical in actually shaping the nature and the character of what becomes the norm in the behavioral patterns of young people. Early childhood development, I think, is, is something that is under... Um, um, it's under-addressed. It's, it's, it's something that we, we think early childhood development means let's, let's teach a child to count one, two, three, let them, let's teach them the ABCs. But, but what, are the, what are the family value systems that we need to teach them in early childhood development? How, how do we create those hubs of community centers that actually take children away from the, the violent family environment and teach them a loving, caring environment? One of the things that helped me overcome the challenges in my life is that I've always had somebody loving to mentor and guide me along life. And that made a fundamental difference in the choices that I made. My brothers on the other end uh, replicated my father's behavior and became violent and also became addicted to drugs and alcohol. They didn't have the opportunity to be exposed to certain people who actually took them in and taught them an alternative to, to the behavioral patterns. And, and I was so privileged to have um, loving people walk into my life and teach me the right thing. My grandmother was one of the greatest mentors in my life because she taught me a new value system, an important value system, a value system that should be caring and loving and, 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 and that sort of thing. So I'm saying in order to address it, it's not going to be a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. There's going to be different aspects of society that you have to break up into different um, different sections that address different problems. Do we understand that psychological problems and physiological problems, what percentage of these people have physiological brain issues that actually lead to violent behavior, schizophrenia, bipolar, those mental illnesses that lead to that? We, I, we don't know that for certain. Um, what, what, is, what is it that is influenced by the environmental influence because they've witnessed violence. So it's very important to have a micro um, um, uh, analysis of what happens at the micro mm -hmm. level in the family unit through a higher involvement of social workers and social intervention and at the same time at a macro mm -hmm. level okay. are we looking at the patterns and the norms as we go through from one society to another. Thank you so much. I, I know time is not on side, but we're excited to have uh, Pastor Mark with us and as he shares about uh, the, the project rate. Unfortunately, we're, we're at the end of our time, but I'm just going to give um, Pastor Mark to just share briefly uh, in, in 30 seconds uh, about how if you invite people to come and be part of Project Rage, what invitation is available and how do they get in touch. I think we'll put also some details on the screen, just maybe address them on the needs on how they can be partner with what you do. Okay, look, Project Rage is, is project, what's important to, for Project Rage is uh, it's not just a, an organization that wants to address gender-based violence. It's an organization that wants to address the root causes of some of the challenges. So some of the strategic objectives is we need volunteers that will help, help us to go into GBV centers and refurbish and, 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 and help to um, rebuild and create a pleasant environment for the survivors of gender-based violence. And, 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 and it goes on to our legal aspects, creating a, a national database of gender-based violence 
perpetrators so that should you should a woman actually want to date someone they have a source reference to go back and think okay this guy has been charged five times for gender-based violence uh, I should avoid dating him there's pro there's three aspects to it reactive proactive and real-time so basically in our real-time response we want to be able to create a panic button which we need funding for so everything in life requires financial resources for in order for it to succeed if you are willing to help us we have a solid business plan and a solid platform where there's full accountability because we are a registered company so you can contact us on my number which is 084-2473-670 our email address is info info dot project rage at gmail.com or you could visit our website which is www.gotgo g-o-t-g-o w-e-b gotgoweb.com and we'll have all the information there we're also on a campaign called flip the coin on this rage which we are trying to convince one million men to take a pledge uh, a beautiful pledge and become ambassadors of project rage so that we create hubs of people that can actually become leaders for gender-based violence anonymous in their communities. So that's basically our um, contact information. Thank you so much. We appreciate for you that we got your time to be able to come and spend with us. We thank you. I think we will be, um, you, there will be more details that are scrolling at the bottom. Uh, check those details out, out uh, support uh, the Project Rage pro pro project in your community. If you want to start it in your own community, get, get to the details, connect with the guys. They are going to be able to be of great help. Thank you so much. Meet us next week. God bless you.